Welcome to the World History One Lecture Series. At the end of each slide, there will be a 10 second delay. Use this time to pause the presentation and complete your notes. When you are done, push play and you will move forward. This lecture will begin in five seconds. Welcome to World History One Lecture 5.7 on the achievements of classical Greece and let's go visit our guidance department. You see, the folks in guidance want you to do well in school, so they're going to put you in classes that focus on the achievements of the Greeks. For example, you're in a history class studying ancient civilizations. In English, you might be studying literature, novel study. Perhaps you took an elective like drama. Tragedies and comedies, go thespians. Drama's not your thing? Then maybe you're sculpting or painting in an art class, or you're designing buildings in an architecture class. We've all had a good dose of science class. And then there's everybody's favorite class, mathematics. All of these classes are based on ideas from Greece. And all of these ideas represent the best of classical Greece. So with that said, let's go to the next slide. Since we're in a World One class, let's start by looking at what the Greeks did with the study of history. Greek historians provided an unbiased, neutral account of Hellenic history. What does that mean? Well, up to this point, people are providing an account of history, but it's history from the viewpoint of their civilization. They're telling you how to interpret what you're seeing. The Greeks don't do that. Instead, the Greeks just tell you what happened, and they leave it up to you to decide what you've seen and how that should affect you. There are two historians who are going to make this happen. Herodotus, who's at 440 BCE, is the father of history. He is the first person to actively travel the world, and he's going to report his accounts of the Persian Wars to everybody. The other historian is Thucydides. He's around from 420 to 411 BCE, and he wrote about the Peloponnesian War. That's a war between Athens and Sparta, which we'll talk about next class. Go to the next slide. Next, let's look at what the Greeks do with literature and drama. And when it comes to Greek literature, we're going to talk about this guy again, Homer. So this is going to be a review. Homer is around 750 BCE, and he creates lyrical poems during the Dorian Age about Greece. The poems are the Iliad, the ten-year battle between Troy and the Messene, and the Odyssey. That's Odysseus' ten-year trek home. Homer's poems are transcribed. Remember, Homer is a blind poet, so they're going to be written down as he's speaking the poems between 750 and 700 BCE. Now let's talk about Greek drama. And we're going to focus on a type of drama called tragedies, which are a form of drama based on human suffering. And we have two famous dramatists. One is the Sicilies, he writes the Oresteria, and Sophocles, who wrote Antigone. We have literature, which is Homer, and drama, Sicilies and Sophocles. Go to the next slide. Greek art and architecture is neat because we are surrounded by examples of it everywhere in our civilization. When it comes to Greek art, the primary art form is sculpture, which attempts to depict the perfect human. You can see our discus guy up here. He's been made out of a piece of rock into what that artist believed was an example of a perfect human body. Phidias is a sculptor who sculpts the goddess Athena. And he does this between 450 to 430 BCE. When it comes to Greek architecture, there are three things you need to know. You need to know about the Acropolis. 
That is the city on the top of the hill in Athens, and it is built and rebuilt multiple times. The building on the top of the Acropolis is the Parthenon, that is also built and rebuilt multiple times. And then we have Greek columns. Columns support roofs. There are Doric or plain columns, Ionian, which are moderate columns, and Corinthian, which are ornate or spectacular looking columns. Go to the next slide. Modern science classes are based on the discoveries of classical Greek scientists. They were rational thinkers who understood that things happen for a reason. For example, we have Hippocrates. He's here around 370 BCE. He's a doctor who stated that all disease has natural causes. What does that mean? Well, up to this point, Greeks think they're getting sick because they angered a god or goddess. Hippocrates turns around and says, no, we're getting sick because something in the natural world around us made us sick. Hippocrates also realized that as a doctor he had a special responsibility to his patients to first do no harm. We call that the Hippocratic Oath. Archimedes is here around 330 BCE and he contributed to understanding fundamental physics. Archimedes is one of the first guys who says there's an order in which things happen in the natural world. For example, we have this fantastic roller coaster at Great Adventure in Jackson, New Jersey, Kang Da Kong. We know how it works because there's a natural order in the world. Thank you, Archimedes. Go to the next slide. Someone once said that mathematics is a universal language. No matter where you are in the world, the math is the same. Well, here's the cool part. As we reach the golden age of Greece, we're also approaching the golden age of other civilizations, like India. So some math is developing in India, like the concept of 0 and 1 through 10, while other math is developing in places like Greece. They're developing geometry. Pythagoras is here around 480 BCE. He's the guy who developed the Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Almost all of geometry is based on this principle. Euclid, who's here around 270 BCE, he wrote the seminal text on geometry. A lot of the stuff you study in geometry class is based on what this guy came up with. So when it comes to geometry and math, it's all Greek to me. Thank you for watching this lecture and I look forward to seeing you in class.